Okay. Thank you to everybody for joining. We are hopefully going to continue tonight with our Shior on Modim. Last week we covered the complexities of the Bracha of Ritzay. And tonight we move forward one Bracha with the Bracha of Modim. I'll start with the most interesting fact about Modim. Most interesting fact, and again, I'm, I'm cheating here when I call it a fact because it's really a theory, is that Modim was most probably the last Bracha of Shmona Esrei. Meaning, originally, before Shmona Esrei was completed in its complete form by Rabbi Gamliel, the Shmona Esrei ended with Modim. Hoda was the last bracha of Shmona Esrei. And Birchus Kohanim was a response from the Kohanim to the people in the base of Mikdash. Meaning, we saw already many times in the Mishnayot, we saw that in the Beit HaMikdash and in the early forms of Shmona Esrei, we had a tripartite structure. We had first three blessings, right? You had the first three blessings, Avot, Kivurot, and, and, and Kiddushot. You had middle blessings, and then you had the final three. You had the Brachot of Avodah, Hoda'ah, Berkat Kohanim. So we know that Hoda'ah, as a bracha, we don't know the text, but we know that the the bracha of Hoda of Thanksgiving in the temple, in the in the Beit Hamikdash, uh, existed. We know that Modim is one of the most ancient brachot of Shmon Esrei, so it's one of the first and last three. Do we know the text they used in the Beit Hamikdash? No, we know the Mishnah uh, does mention the word Modim, but you know more than that we might not know. However, the argument I want to make tonight, and I want to convince you of, is that. Originally, Modim was seen as the last brach of Shmon Esrei, and Birkat Kohanim was seen as a response from the Kohanim to the people. Once they completed their set of brachot, the Kohanim would then, in dialogue with the people, bless them for having worshipped in the Beit HaMikdash, for having done the Shmon Esrei. So how are we going to uh, uh, develop this theory? Let's first start with what I believe is the most famous mischaracterization of the Shmon Esrei, and that is within the tripartite structure itself, which is that it's typically divided into three parts, the first three and the 12 intermediate brachas and the final three, that tripartite structure has been mix mischaracterized throughout the ages as praise, petition, and thanksgiving. This is a very attractive structure because when you look at the structure, you're looking at Something which affords the Shemayin Esrei not just affords a form of logic, but also a form of symmetry. It gives you a way to uh, make it look like it's there's a, there's almost a a uh, oh, there's a fancier word for this, but I'm forgetting it. But that there is a symmetry where one part complements the other, one half complements the other half. You begin with a praise, um, and then you the middle is a petition, and the last part is a thanksgiving. And this. Uh, tripartite structure, this argument or theory for how the, the Shmon Esrei is developed, I believe is a bit of a mischaracterization because it really isn't that simple. Where do we know this from? Where does this come from? Let's 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 start with the Mikorot for this idea of a tripartite structure, and I'll continue to why I believe um, it's not so simple. Says the Gemara in the Yushami, Rabbi Acha B'Shem Rabbi Shub and Levi Yomer, Af Mishi Hitzkina Tatfila Hazot Al Haseder Hitzkina so too, uh, continuing from before, this the the ones the the rabbis who instituted the Shmona Esrei instituted the eighteen brachot according to a set logical order. Shalosh brachot harishonot, this shalosh brachot achronot. The first three and the last three shivcho shemalkom are praise of Hashem. Vehem tzayot tzarchan shalbriyot, but the middle twelve are uh, the needs of. Uh, of the creations, meaning these are our own personal communal needs. Now, this is the first source for this. But note how note how the how Rabbi Shubham Levi doesn't say the first three are praise, the middle three are, are petitions, and the last three are thanksgiving or gratitude. He says that the la first three and the last three are praise. Correct. Now let's nuance this. The Gemara in Brachot in Bavli, the Flamadalit Amaralov says, "Amr Yehuda." And Yehuda says, "Lo la mali shal adam sachav lo b'shalosh achot mishenot, v'lo b'shalosh achonot." The person should never ask petitions of the first three or the last three. Alabam siot. If a person wants to add personal petitions into the shmonesrei, he should do it in the middle ones. 
Damar Bechanina, why? Bechanina says, and this is a, a nuanced version of what we just saw in Rishub and Levi, the Rishonot, the first three, are Domel Le'avetche Mesader Shevach Lefnei Rabo. The first three are like a Eved, like a servant who comes before his master with a petition, and he first starts by flattering his master. Emtsayot, Domel Le'avetche Mesader Pras Mei Rabo. The middles are like the slave, the servant who asks for his portion from the master. He asks him for his petition. Achronot, and the last ones are Domel Le'avetche Kibel Pras Mei Rabo V'Niftar Baholechlo. The, the last three brachot are like the Eved who received the, the portion from his master and then takes depart, uh, takes uh, part from him and, and goes on his way. He takes, uh, what's the better word for that? He, uh, he parts his ways with him and he goes. So if you look at that language, he never says that it's gratitude per se, but he does say that he is uh, take. Uh, a parting ways or or saying parting words for his master. So from these two Gemaras came roughly four different ways to approach the the tripartite structure. First, you have Rabbi Shuvan Levi, who says it's praise, petitions, and praise. Then you have Rabbi Hanina, who says praise and petitions, and then he implies to a degree that it's gratitude. But then if you fast forward eight, uh, blah, 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 600 years, you get Rabbi Sadia Gaon. Rabbi Sadia Gaon disregards the Gemara. Rav Sadigain says, no, look at the Gemara's structure. And this is in his Siddur, page three. He says, the first three brachas are gratitude. Those are haida. The first three brachas are haida. What are they haida for? L'sha'avar, anything that we that had in the past. We thank Hashem for the Gvurais. We thank Hashem for what he did for, for, for our forefathers. And, and uh, we thank Hashem for his malchus upon us. The middle 12 are requests for the future. The middle 12 brachas are requests, uh, petitions for the future. The last three are acknowledging Hashem's divine power. While the Rambam is the one who interprets Rebchanina literally, the Rambam in Hochis Tefillah, Perak Aleph, Halacha Dal, it says that the first three are praise, the middle 12 are, are petition, and the last three are gratitude. Now, why is there such a friction here between the Amirayim and the Rishayim? And what's going on? The reason is because, well, it's not so simple. How could you say that the last three are about Thanksgiving? Avoda is a bracha where we ask Hashem a petition to accept our um, prayers and to accept our korbanos. Sim Shalom is a bracha where we ask Hashem to, to place peace upon the Jewish people. Those are both petitions. How could you say the last three are Thanksgiving? This is already something that the Rishonim points out. Rabbi Nuchanan points this out. The tour. All of the uh, Rishonim point out this problem. And many of the Rishonim give an answer where they say that what this means is that, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you cannot have, that the last three are not places where you could have petitions for the Yahid, but the last three are petitions for, uh, can have petitions for communal needs. And communal petitions are somehow, some way, similar enough to Thanksgiving, and therefore they fit the theme. Honestly, none of the, none of those theories are really neat. Um, a lot of the answers are a little bit forced. To say that the last three brachos of Shmon Esrei are all talking about hodaaz is a little bit forced. And the and honestly, the answers you give matter. They halachically matter because uh, the the Gemara essentially says you cannot put bakashos in the first three and the last three. And the Gaonim were already dealing with this. All of those interpolations that we put for us, Sarasimei Tshuva, right? Like, chtov lechaim tovim kol b'nei b'ritecha, or zachreinu lechaim. Those are petitions that you're putting in the first three and the last three of Shimon Esrei. And therefore, uh, how exactly you reconcile these contradictions is halakhically important. Uh, eventually, we decided that, you know, Sharche Rabin was allowed, but that's that's neither here nor there. Now, my suspicion is that the Rambam, the Rambam had a different girsa in our Gemara. If you look in the, in the Oxford manuscript, in um, manuscript 366, the Oxford manuscript doesn't say v'niftar v'holechlo. The the um, Oxford manuscript of the Gemara says u'mishabecho v'holechlo, and he praises him and leaves. It's possible that the Rambam had that girs on the Gemara, and he understood it as, and he thanks him and he leaves. Now the Rambam is no fool, but if you know and you understand 
how the Rambam paskins, especially the way he writes in Hilchay Tzvila, in, in uh, sorry, Nada Chazaka, very often, even if the Rambam doesn't fully understand the Gemara, or a Gemara is not 100% congruous, the Rambam will still um, faithfully replicate the Gemara's structures, even if the Rambam is not convinced, completely convinced of how the Gemara puts down the law. This is very typical of the Rambam. If there's a steer on Gemara, if there's a Gemara which doesn't give you 100% clarity, but it's 90% of the way there, and that's the halacha, the Rambam will still faithfully reproduce what the Gemara said, even if he doesn't completely understand it. The Rambam doesn't go into apologetics here. He doesn't try to explain the Gemara and explain why the last three are Thanksgiving. He just simply says, you know, the first uh, first three are petition, last, last three, sorry, first three are praise, last three are Thanksgiving, and the middle are petitions. He doesn't go into the deep theology of how that's how that's even possible. Okay. Now, another reason I believe that it's possible that the Rambam is correct, and this, uh, another reason that we could reconcile, uh, another way that we could reconcile this tripartite uh, structure as delineated by Rabbi Hanina, is if we accept the hypothesis that Modim was the last bracha of Shimon Esrei. Think about it this way. You have the first three brachot, brachot which introduce the Shimon Esrei. You have the middle petitions. Then the, you have the Avodah, which itself is one of the petitions. It's almost like the pen, the ultimate Shomea Tefillah. It's the ultimate um, bracha that was said in, in, in the... Uh, Beit HaMikdash, and it's added after the normal petitions because this is a this is the you know the most prestigious one, and then finally you end with Modim. You end you end with a Hoda'ah. That's how the entire Shmona Esrei would end. In other words, Reb and Reb Shulam and Levi are reflecting the earlier attitudes of Shmona Esrei because for them, yes, you have a tripartite structure. You have opening with praise, middle petitions, and then you close with Modim. That's the end of Shmon Esrei. Sim Shalom and Berchus Kohanim are really a response to Shmon Esrei. They are not a proper part of Shmon Esrei in their consciousness. The way they thought of Shmon Esrei is that Sim Shalom wasn't a proper part of it. So I'm going to bring two more Raya to this. Um, raya number one. Gemaran Brachot Aflamidal Ramadal says like this. Tanu Rabbanan, Elu Brachot Shadam Shochet Bahen. We learned in a Tosefta. Remember, this is a source from the Tanaim, really early, from uh, first century, second century. There, these are brachot in which you bow. Ba'avot You bow by the bracha of avot, the beginning of the end. In behoda'at chila v'sof. And by modem, you bow in the beginning and the end. But if you wanted to bow at the beginning and end of every bracha, we tell him not to do that. It's better not, for the Gemara has its reasons. But essentially, just do it at Avot and do it at Modim. Now, later, the Gemara actually has a bit of a confused discussion here. So my theory would be, of course, uh, in line with all this, that the bowing is the opening of, of the Shmon Esrei and the closing of the Shmon Esrei. It's very common in a in a uh, a liturgy, which is a worship, a ritual, which is oral in nature. It's a culture which is oral oral in nature that you need to give people cues, right? So the bowing would be a cue that this is the beginning, and the bowing would be a cue that this is the end of Shmon Esrei. There's no sidurim. There's no ways to explain that to people. All of the cues had to be oral and verbal. So I'm sorry. Well, uh, performative, so to speak. So if someone was going to give a cue. The bowing would be, I would hypothesize, I would uh, argue, I should say, that this theory is correct. That the bowing, the beginning of avot, meaning the beginning of the first bracha and the end of the first bracha, the beginning of the last, uh, the beginning of modem and the end of modem is because in the time of the Tanoim, they still understood modem as the last bracha Shmon Esri. Now look here at the Gemara on Daf Lamid, I think this is Lamid Dalid Amud. Bays, yeah, the Islam Dalim Bays. The Gemara says like this: Tani Chada. By the time of the Maroim, by the top line here, Hakorea Behayda Haraisa Meshuba, the Tani Ida Haraisa Meguna. We have two brayzas. One says that a person who bows by Ma'idim it's a great thing. The other one says who bows by Ma'idim it's a deplorable thing. 
So Gemara tries to reconcile it. Like Kasha Habitchila Halabasaif. Well, maybe it means, well, this is at the beginning of Maidim, it's the end of Maidim. The Gemara contradicks that. It says Rava Karbahi Dathil Basaif. We know that Rava the Amora would would bow at the beginning of the end of Modim. Amri the Rabbana, the Rabbana and his the rabbis around him asked him, Amai Kavid Marhachi, why are you doing this? We have a bryce against that. Amar Luhu, Chazina, Lerv Nachman, the Kara. I don't know. I saw Rav Nachman used to bow before at the end and at the end of every modem. That's why I bow at the end of before and at the end of every modem. The Chazina later of Shesh is the Ka Avidachi. Essentially, what Rav is saying is, I have no idea why I bow at the beginning of the end at the end of modem, but I know I saw Rav Nachman do it and I saw Rav Shesh do it, so I do it. Furthermore, you have two prices which contradict each other. The Gemara tries to reconcile the contradiction by saying one is talking about Halal, Haidah by Halal, the other one's talking about Haidah by, by, by Berch Samazin. That's possible. It's, it's also possible that attitudes changed. Essentially, while Maidim was still known as the last Baruch of Shemayin Esrei, it made sense to bow. But once Simshalim became a part of Rishim ben Gamliel, or ben Gamliel Biyavna, I should say, or ben Gamliel Biyavna Shmein Esrei, and Simshalim was the last one, then there was a second opinion in the Tanoim that it made no sense to bow by Maidim, rather it made more sense to bow while you were backing up for Simshalom. That's my own conjecture, my own theory, but I'm not alone in this. Furthermore, let's go to 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 a a um another Gemara, the Gemara in Afkafal from a base. Uh, do I have this correctly? Sorry. Give me a second to pull this up correctly. Yeah, I have it here. Says the Gemara. Amar Avuna, Haniknas. I'm just giving you a second to make sure I have the right one. Yeah. This is a very famous Gemara. The Gemara says a person who comes late to shul and he finds everybody already started Shemayin Esrei, what does he do? If he could start and and get through Shemayin Esrei fast enough before the Shliach Tiber reaches Maidim, he should daven. And if not, he should not daven. The halacha is, however, like a Yeshua ben Levi. Yeshua ben Levi, Amar, Im yachal ha'aschel b'ligmar ha'chalei yagi ha'shiach tiber le'kedusha yispalo v'im laba yispalo. Meaning, let's say you get to Landau's, right? There's multiple minyanim you could get to. You walk in, and you see that they've already started Shemayin Esrei, right? Very common occurrence. You walk in by Mincha, they started two minutes ago. If you could start Shemayin Esrei, and you could end Shemayin Esrei before they get up to Kedusha, start with this minyan. If not, wait for the next minyan. That's what the halacha says. But the first, but the first Amira holds that Maidim is the bracha you care about. Why Maidim? Why would it be Maidim? Unless Reb Huna understood understood Maidim as the last bracha of Shmain Esrei, this makes no sense. It must be that Reb Huna held that until the Shiach Tzibur finishes Shmain Esrei proper, meaning the entire Chazaris Hashats, as long as the Shiach Tzibur is is in middle of the of the Chazaris Hashats, if you could finish before he's done Chazaris Hashats, you're good. While Yeshua ben Levi holds no until he gets to Kedusha, because Kedusha um, is essentially, if you're there for Kedusha, you're participating. If you're not there for Kedusha, you're not participating. While Rav Huna thought, no, up till Maidim is 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 um, part of Chazar Sashatz. After Maidim is already Berach Sakehanim, that's not part of the Shemayin Esrei proper. That's Raya number, I think we're up to number three already. Okay. Um, Taisus over here actually has a different solution. I think he has, his answer is, why Maidim? I'm trying to remember why Taisa says Maidim. Um, it's a bit of a forced answer, and I'm, I'm, it's escaped my mind. Give me a second. Taisa holds that I think it's talking about Maidim Durabanan. Hold on. I'm sorry, it's it's blanking. If I had the full Afkamar before me, I, I would remember. But okay, uh, I'll do Shuva. I'll remember next time. The next Raya I want to bring is from another Gemara here on... The Gemara on Lamedalid Amud Beis. Ah, do I have it here? Yes, here we go. The Gemara is, this is a long Gemara. Oh boy. No, you know what? I didn't actually, I didn't actually uh, give a slide for this Gemara. But okay, there's three other scholars who do this as well, who also have this theory. Let me, let me find the, the page in the Gemara so I could read it to you. The Gemara essentially says, Andaf Lamed Dalit Amabez. Amr Bar Safra Mishum Khadebe Rebbe. 
Rav Safra said the shame one person in the house of Revi, but Avos, uh, Avos. Ika the Masi la Brisa mespalal tzorich yisheichavin esli by bekulan. There's a Brisa that says a person has to have kavana by all the brachos. Vim ena yachol lechavin bekulan yechavin esli by beachas. Right, if a person cannot have kavana by all the brachos of Shmei Nesrei, he should have kavana at least by one bracha Shmei Nesrei. Amar of Chiyamar of Safra mashum chadivei Rebbe ba Avos. Rav Chia says Shem of Safra that what does it mean? It means that if a person has no strength to to have kavana by the entire Shmei Nesrei, at least he has to have kavana by the first bracha of Shmei Nesrei. That's the minimum, and that's the halacha brought in the Gemara. That's the halacha brought in the Paiskim that the minimum. Uh, Kavana you have to have by Shemina Esrei is at least for the first bracha. However, the Agos Mamonios and a few other early Ashkenazic sources bring another Gers of the Gemara where the Gemara says B'Shem of Chista that it's not Avos which is the most important, it's Modim that's the last, that's the most important. Meaning that you would have to have Kavana by Modim. And I think it's the Smak, the Savior Mitzvah Zakatan, who Paskins like both. He says, uh, the you should have uh, kavana by both avais and maidim together. Why? Again, I I would argue that this this also aligns with this theory that avos and modim were originally the first and last brachas of uh, Shmai Nesrei, and so is argued by Ruben Kimmelman, Uri Erloch, and Menachem Kister, three scholars who. Um, uh, and sorry, I left out Henshka, David Henshka. Uh, David Henshka also believes that. Um, that these brachas were originally uh, the first and last brachas. Give me one more second. Yes. Last raya. Rabbi Damid, it's a parent by Kamei of Mana. Gemara and Yushami we saw last week. Echan Omra. Gemara and Yushami, one last, one last raya. The Gemara and Yushami says, Where do I put the bracha of Nachim? Where do I put the bracha of Nachim in Tishabav? Amr Lay, he said to him, he said to his Talmud, Vadayan in Atlazu. You still didn't get the get the, the pattern here. Kol davashu lavo amar b'avoda. Any prayer which is for the future, we say in avoda. Kol davashu l'sha'avar omer b'avoda. But everything that pertains to the past, we put in the bracha of modem. Why would you put alanisim in modem? Why would you put nachim in modem? Why would you put, for example, or belezer shita havdala in modem? Probably because Modim was the last bracha of the Shmon Esrei. And if we're going to put a reference to the occasion in the Shmon Esrei, according to these Tanoim, it was it was the most appropriate place to put a reference to the occasion for um, something which is which already happened had to be in the final bracha of Shmon Esrei. Okay, I think I've exhausted. Uh, no, I have one more Raya. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in my notes, one more raya is Menachem Kister. Uh, he brings, and I, 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 I do not apologize for not bringing this, but Kister uh, brings has a has a very uh, deep study on the Apostolic Constitutions, which is an early Christian text. The Apostolic Constitutions has a a um, essentially a derivative prayer from rabbinic prayer. There's a Christian prayer there, which is very similar to our Shemayna Esrei on Shabbos, and the last bracha in that. Christian prayer is the bracha for Haida. There's no bracha there for Kehanim. There's no bracha there for Sim Shalim. So again, this is another raya that in the earliest times, the Tanoim and the early Amairayim understood Maidim as the final bracha of Shemayin Esrei and the Birchas Kehanim or Sim Shalim, whatever you want to call it, as a response to the Shemayin Esrei itself. Okay. Let us finally study the Nusrais of the bracha. Um, as follows. The earliest source of the Gemara of the Mishnah just calls this bracha Haida. It doesn't give us a Nusach for Maidim, and that's fine. It doesn't seem that it actually matters to the Mishnah what, you, what Nusach you use for the bracha Maidim, as, as is true with many of the other brachas, brachas of Shemayin Asrei. However, the bracha of Maidim gets special treatment by the Mishnahis and brachas. The Mishnah says as follows, Ha'oymer, a person who says, Al-kan tzipor ya mecha. A person who says the language for the bracha of modem, which begins with, Kan tzipor ya mecha, or another version of modem, Ve'al tov shemecha, or another version of modem, Modim, modim, 
Mishat's Kinoto. We silence him. A prayer leader who who uses one of these three versions for modem, we silence him. Why? Because they're similar to heresy. Not that they're rank heresy, but they are similar to heresy. So what does this mean? Let's see the Gemara. We have to go through. We have to go through through this together to understand it. The Gemara seems to be completely familiar with what the Mishnah is talking about. We don't know what the Gemara is talking about. We don't know what the Mishnah is talking about today in 2024. But the Gemara knew. It says the Mishnah didn't approve of the Nusach of Maidim, which says Maidim Maidim, because it sounds like. You're thanking two different deities. It sounds like it's Zoroastrian or even worse, pagan. So my own gut feeling is that this was a litany, meaning that it began with Maidim Anachulach, Maidim, Modim Lashem Alokenu, Maidim, etc. In other words, this was a litany of verses that all began with Maidim. I could be wrong, but that's my my gut feeling. However, it could be it was just a duplicate that began Modim Anachulach, Modim Anachulach, Lashem Alokenu. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the Nusach was. My feeling is that it was a litany, but we, we, Adayom is that we don't know. Says the Gemara further, the version which begins, uh, that for the good we shall remember your name, that's also not a good version of Modim because that sounds like only for the good we remember God and not for the bad. Again, this sounds like there were multiple versions. This is support for Joseph Heinemann's theory. That there were multiple multiple interchangeable versions of brachis for Shemayin Esrei that were used in the time of the Tanaim. However, uh, the Tanaim, the rabbis eventually fixed the ones that they consider the most appropriate. Vitznan, right? We also learned that a person has to bless Hashem for the good, just like he does on the bad. Therefore, um, we can't say Al Tovi Zachar Shmecha, Al Kan Sipor Yagiur Achamecha My Taima My Taima. Why can't you say the version which begins with, oh God, you have had mercy on the frail bird, right? The the uh, the bird in its nest, referring to, to Shiloh HaKain, right? So we could imagine, we don't know what the Gersa is, but we could imagine that the Gersa said that just like you, Hashem, had mercy on the birds of the nest, so too you should have mercy on us in Klai Yisrael. So my time, why can't I say that? Pligi batre amayroi b'marava, tu amayroi minari tisrael. Um, argue as to exactly what the reason is. This is an extremely important Gemara for Jewish theology. One, Amira holds, you can't say this because you're going to make some creations of the earth jealous of others, that Hashem has more mercy on, for example, the birds of a nest than he does on human beings and children that die in war and whatever. You can't say such a thing. The other Amayar says, no, that's not why. It's because you're making it sound like a Kaddish Baruch whose attributes, the way he acts with the world, are all merciful. However, they are not. You cannot char- characterize God as merciful. You have to characterize God as unknowable. You must characterize God as the Ramam holds, apophatically, and say that you don't know. They're all decrees. We don't know what Hashem does for the good or for the bad. They are all decrees. There's no objective Right and wrong. There's no such a thing as right and wrong, uh, mercy and 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 evil, uh, good and evil. These are all what God wants. What God does is what we, the humans, call right. What God doesn't want is what we humans call wrong. And uh, where God shows compassion is what we could call mercy. But you can't you can't necessarily say that Hashem is is uh, more merc- is like merciful. That's that's what it sounds like. Okay, how did I the rabba? And here's here's where this gets actually fascinating. A person, there was a chazan who came and began Shmon Esrei in the presence of the Amora Rabba. Rabba was one of the big, most important Amora. He taught Abaya and Rabba. The Amar Atachastal Kantipar Atachusrachim Alenu. Right, this chazan said, "You Hashem, you you had mercy on the Kantipar. You too, sh- you sh- you so should you also have mercy upon us, the Jewish people." Amar Rabba, Rabba said sarcastically, Kama yada Rabbana, Wow, this guy is such a Tamil Chacham. He knows exactly how to praise, to, to, to um, beseech Hashem. Amar Le Abaye, his student Abaye said, uh, What are you talking about, Rebbe? Uh, the Mishnah says that we have to silence him. The Gemara explains, Rabba Nami Chodude Abaye, who the Bay. Rabba was just being sarcastic. He was trying to make sure that Abaye was still sharp, that Abaye was going to be clever and 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 refer to him straight back to the Mishnah that we should silence him. 
Who did not come to Rebbechanin? Another story. A person came in front of Rebbechanin and he said, "Akel agad lagiva ranaira, vaadira azuzayira hazak, etc." Actually, we learned this gemara before. Uh, we're not going to do this right now. Okay, but what's important about this gemara? Why is this absolutely fascinating? This is fascinating because already by the time of Rabba, who's in Amira, this halacha in the Mishnah was not accepted. Think about that for a second. 200 years later, by the time of Rabbi Hani, of, of Rabbah and Abaye, this Mishnah, even though it's the halacha in the Mishnah, and there's no other argue, you know, there's no other uh, interlocutor in the Mishnah who disagrees, still, we find that by the time of the Amayrayim, they still had not gotten rid of this Nusuk. What does this tell you about Jewish liturgy? What does this tell you about the study of liturgy in general? This reinforces the idea that the disapproval of the rabbis has a very has very little effect on what actually happens at the Amud. Meaning, insofar as the Mishnah doesn't say it's Usr, the Mishnah does not say that this is an Isra Daraisa, it doesn't say it's an Isra Darabanan. It says Mishatkino, so we silence him because we don't approve of this. Right, the Mishnah says, "I, Rabbeinu Akadash, whoever wrote this Mishnah, we do not approve of this. It's, it, it borders on heresy. The rabbis disapproved of this of the of, of these three versions of Modem. Still, the people, the common folk, kept saying it for hundreds of years, despite generations of rabbanim. So, first of all, this tells you something about rabbinical power. It tells you something historically about how." drastic and how final the the word of the Mishnah was in the time of the Amirayim, right? How long did it take for Mishnah to become ca canon for the word of the Rabbanim to become fixed law? How, how, how long did it take for the rabbis to exert real concrete power over other people? But more so, it tells us something about Jewish liturgy. It tells us that liturgy and tefillah are not just things you say. Tefillah are things that you do. A tefillah is not just words on a page or verb uh, or words that a person has to say by rote. Tefillah is something we do. It's a worship. It's a ritual. It's a some. It's a. It's a. It has its own internal culture, and culture is something that's very, very difficult to move. Even if the rabbis disapprove of something, it's going to be extremely hard to budge people because they feel like this is the way we've done it. This is the way we've always done it, and just because the rabbis don't like it doesn't mean the way we're going to stop doing it. This is our Messiah. This is our Nusuch. We're going to do it no matter what. And this is something you have to remember because this doesn't stop in the time of the Amai Royim. This goes on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We find this in the Rishayim. We find this in the Achrayim. We find this all over Tefillah. We find Nusrays that the Ge'inim don't approve of. We find Nusrays that the Rishayim don't approve of. We find halachas that the Rishayim don't approve of, and yet they've been carried on for hundreds of years. Easy examples are one we just one we, uh, two that we just mentioned in this year alone. We mentioned, for example, Aser Simei right? The Ga'inim came out against saying uh, all the interpolations, like Zachreinu Lachayim, Bichamaycha They said, you can't put that in middle Shemayin Esrei. It, it, it's an interruption. Not a good nusach. People did it anyway. Berchus Kehanim. When when did people stop saying Berchus Kehanim? Berchus Kehanim is a chi of Duraisa. There's absolutely no reason Ashkenazim should no longer be doing Berchus Kehanim every day. And the Rishonim say as much. The Rishonim uh, assume that everybody says Berchus Kehanim every day. It isn't until the Maharil where he says people stop saying it and he doesn't know why. So even though Halacha could be clear um, or uh, rabbinical opinion can be clear, once people get it fixed, into their ritual, into their culture, that this is how we do things. Whether or not this is the Torah's opinion or not, it is very, very hard to budge them. And it's very hard to change something which isn't necessarily the domain of the rabbis. Tefillah and worship as it exists in the synagogue, as it exists in the community, tefillah as it exists in the community is not something which the Rabbanim own. It's not something which uh, even halacha, the sifrei halacha, can command completely because it is only manifested by the people who conduct it. You don't have a tefillah without a minion. You don't have 
a community without people. Tfilah is nothing without the people who do it. And therefore, the people who are davening own the davening. As every rabbi who has tenure, every rabbi who has experience knows, it is the people who have davening who, who are davening, the people who show up who really own the minion. And as hard as you can try as a rabbi to make them do what you want to do, they are just not going to do it. Speak to any rabbi who tried to minimize the Kaddishes. Speak to any rabbi who tried telling them to stop splitting minyanim for a quote-unquote chiyot. There are so many frustrations rabbi, rabbis have every day with halachai and tefillah. It's very hard to change because people are very set in their ways. And unfortunately, the shikles, this is not just true of tefillah. This is also true of other areas of halacha where people feel like their culture is their minig, their culture is their Messira, and therefore this is also somehow Torah values, and this is also something that they should that they should do even though it is not rabbinical opinion, it is not authentic Torah opinion. So what your opinion is of this is, and how you believe you should act, I'll leave to you, I'll leave it up to you to, to the listener. I, you know, I'm not to, I'm not going to give you a muster. I'm not going to tell you what to do, what not to do. Do not to do There's a hundred different examples we could all give, but this does give you a lesson that tefillah is not the law of Moses. It's not something that came from, uh, it's not something which is projected from Shulchan Aruch onto the pages of your Siddur. Tefillah is infinitely more complex than that. As you see, even at the time of the Amirayim, people were refusing to a, to let go of a Nusuch, which the Mishnah, in, in uh, what's it called, explicitly disapproves of. Okay. Um, textual development. We do. We are completely out of time. But let's, briefly touch on uh, textual development and the Nusach. And if we have more time next week, we will discuss it in, in more depth. We'll discuss the Maidim Jarabanan and we'll discuss uh, more things if we have time. I'm not sure when they're about to do Kaddish here, but okay. Uh, essentially, we have two major recensions, two major uh, text families that that trickle down throughout history uh, of Modim. Very typical, Nusach Eretz Yisrael and Nusach Babel. Nusach Eretz Yisrael, of course, comes from the yeshivas and the centers of learning of the Gaonim and Eretz Yisrael, those who follow Talmud Yushami, and the yeshivas and the centers of learning that follow the, the Talmud Habavli and Nusach Bavel, the Gaonim and Bavel. So, we have these two major ascensions. One is Moedem Anachlach Atuhu Hashem Alkeinu Alkev Asenu, and it ends Baruch Atah Hashem Atov Shimcha Lacha Lahodos. Uh, sorry, Baruch Atah Hashem Atov Lacha Lahodos, and then we have the Bavli, which is Moedem and it ends The textual development here, as you could see on the screen if you're following the video, is extremely complicated. Modem is one of those brachos which has a textual development with which even contemporary scholars struggle to understand. And we are about to start Kaddish. I have to end it here. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to pause the recording and we will Hashem continue uh, next week. Thank you really so much for coming.